and greetings to everyone in the room, in the Zoom room. The Link Descendants Working Group is delighted to have some time to introduce ourselves to you. The team here is Allison Thomas, Angela Dickey, Jerry Stewart, Libby Flock, Sharon Morgan, and myself. And we're, today we're gonna tell you something about how the group came to be, who's in the group, the journey that we're all on and that many people in coming to the table are on as well about writing stories related to the journey. We're gonna hear about the wonderful resource that is our Black Ancestry. And we're gonna wrap up by sharing some of the things that we've learned as linked descendants, but we think they're of value to, to anybody in coming to the table. And we're gonna start with a story you actually have already heard part of, but it is also the origin story of the Link Descendants Working Group. It goes back to the 1980s when the Black Hairston family extended an invitation to Waller Hairston and his son, Will Hairston, to attend their family reunion. <clears throat> and Waller and Will and their linked descendants took so warmly to one another that they continued attending for years to follow. In the 2000s, the Hemings family was at a, a, a Jefferson Family Association meeting and they met some of their linked descendants, including Susan Hutchison, myself, and other people who are part of coming to the table. And the more we talked among ourselves with our linked descendants, the more that Susan began to realize that this was a pretty unique platform for talking about slavery and its legacies. When, when you have the descendants of an enslaver and the descendants of uh, the enslaved people together. Because Henry Weincheck was at one of these meetings, he knew Will and he introduced Susan and Will. Susan, uh, Will suggested to Susan that they should go talk to the Center for Justice and Peace Building at Eastern Mennonite University where he was working. And the center was very receptive and pleased to have this idea brought to them. And a committee of what were at the time link descendants got together and developed the first inklings of a concept of coming to the table, enough that um, in January 2006, we held a pilot gathering and you saw a lot of material from that gathering. I had, I was crying through a lot of that part of the video, I have to say. So at that first meeting, many of the people attending were linked descendants, but as coming to the table grew and expanded, um, it was obvious that we wanted many more people to come to the table. We didn't wanna limit people to having some kind of linked descendant um, connection or to being necessarily involved in family history research. But by 2012, um, a group of the descendants of, I think we're, I'm gonna try to remember to call them formerly free Africans in honor of Dr. DeGru, um, and the descendants of enslavers got together and identified that we were a group that did have some unique needs and wanted to be together, wanted to be affiliated with each other. So we formed the Link Descendants Working Group. And the very first thing that the working group did was to create the blog, Bittersweet, which you'll hear more about, and <clears throat> cast your minds back to technology in 2012. We met by conference call. And we had learning sessions and conversations with other groups like 
our Black ancestry and we were doing it all by conference call. <clears throat> the linked descendants universe encompasses, of course, the national coming to the table group. We are nestled in to that group, represented on its website. If you want to join the group, you can come through the coming to the table website. We really depend on the work of the local affiliate groups because there's so much to be learned through those groups that is relevant to um, one's work researching family history and particularly connecting with linked descendants. And we are equally uh, dependent on the reparations working group because as people learn their family history, as they discover their linked descendants, the descendants of enslavers are very drawn to, to doing some kind of reparative work. There's a lot of the research work that we could not do if we were not partnering with Sharon Morgan and our Black ancestry. And then we have all these other stars in the galaxy, the members of the group and the people they're all linked to. So um, it's a large universe. Who are we? Who are the folks that join this group? Well, they're by and large people who are connected to each other either through slavery, descendants of formerly free Africans and descendants of their enslavers, but they're also people connected to each other through post-Civil War oppression. So descendants of people who set up sharecropping, descendants of people who perpetrated lynchings. And some of us find our ancestors did several of those things. The black and brown people who are doing family history research are doing pretty much the kinds of things you might expect, research, looking for documents and information. They are hoping in some cases they're certainly looking to discover enslavers in many cases. Sometimes they're looking for linked descendants, descendants of the enslavers. They need to process their history and um, they want to take steps toward healing. White people doing family history research are descendants of enslavers. They're doing a lot of the same kinds of activities, research, finding documents, looking for linked descendants, processing, taking steps toward healing. And <clears throat> the extra piece I would add to that list is uh, interested in doing healing, um, doing personal and family reparative work. Important people in our world are the founding members of the Link Descendants Group many of whom are still engaged. And much of what we do could not happen if it were not for the leadership team, Libby, Angela, Allison, and myself. And Allison and Libby are also um, taking the lead around all things to do with writing. So they're writing and editing for Bittersweet and setting up writing pods. And you will hear more about those, but I do want to acknowledge the facilitators of the writing pods, Effie, Judy, Leslie, and Tanya. There's a lot of what we do or what we think about doing that we have aspirations for doing that depends on technology. And so thank goodness for Libby and David Hamilton. And the African-American genealogy research is uh, led and largely done by or supported by um, Sharon Morgan. And we have other members of the group who have been very helpful to folks doing um, other kinds of genealogy research. Our mission as a group is to provide leadership to be role models, to create supportive settings 
for having sometimes very painful conversations to provide learning tools and learning events to give support for research and to create opportunities for people to use writing either to process or to share and publish. And I do want to say, at, since uh, the difference between now and 2012, we meet by Zoom. <laughs> We're not using conference calls. Yes, it's such an improvement. Um, and you can see some of the other activities, the connection to our Black ancestry, the blog, the different learning tools. And down in the right-hand corner is just one example of a recent experiment of bursting into artwork. And we'll be doing that again at our meeting on July 29th. So if you'd like to address the legacies of slavery in your own family through art, um, join up and we'll get you involved in that meeting. We had some time today to go through the four approaches. So you've heard them recently. What I want to acknowledge is how thoroughly the Link Descendants Working Group uses those four approaches, maybe in a little more specialized way. So we're certainly uncovering the truth of history tends to be at the family and community or regional level. We're committed to stripping away the whitewash that all too many of our families applied. We're very um, interested, desirous of connecting, connecting within our, within our group, but also connecting as we find out about our linked descendants. Healing takes many forms, including the truth telling and the processing that we do together. Another, other aspects of repairing harms are um, speaking the truth, talking about what really happened, saying the ugly, particularly those of us in families that have hidden the ugly side, have denied it. Another aspect of repairing harms is finding ways to post research and post documents to facilitate other researchers being able to do learn more about their families. And we do look for ways to take reparative action, again, within our families and communities. So we're on a journey from discovery to connection to taking reparative action. And when people join us on the journey, they may be thinking about this list that you saw a minute ago. Oh yeah, I'm gonna do research. I'm gonna find documents. Um, lots of people when they sign up for the group are very excited about finding link descendants. Um, yeah, processing history, healing, all of those things are important. Lots of people interested in doing reparations. And they get into the group and discover that it's a lot more dynamic and complicated than that nice tidy list looked, that there are lots of feelings. There's a really, a need really, a compelling need to talk with other people, to process reactions, to talk with people just about the frustrations of doing research and to channel that irresistible urge to leap into action. So based on the experiences of, I think we have about 150 members and listening to learning from our members, we realize that there's sort of a map that you could follow. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this map, but mostly I'm using it today as a framework into which the other people on our presenter team are going to tell their stories about different phases, their experiences of researching, connecting, building relationships with uh, people they're connected to through slavery. 
But let me just walk you through this map so you have a sense of what, what it is. First of all, doesn't that look tidy? Doesn't that look, you could start on the left and, you know, doink, 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 go along and come out at the end all repaired. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. And I'm not, you know, you know that everybody is aware of that. But I'll tell you about the steps in sequence just for the sake of having somewhere to begin. Um, so people discover that they're, they have a family heritage of slavery and they tend to go in one of three directions. Some of them don't even appear on the map because they make this discovery and they run out of the room. They just don't wanna go there. It's too hard, it's too painful. It's so off they go. Some people have that irresistible urge to take action that we noted, I noted a minute ago, and they go directly there, um, often looking for ways of doing reparations or um, getting involved in activism. And some people get involved in the research. I do want to acknowledge a couple of points about getting involved in the research. One is that for African-American members, um, getting involved in the research is really hard because of the very thorough job that um, white people, enslavers and their descendants have done in either not keeping records to begin with or concealing those records or destroying those records. So that is a challenge for African-American researchers. And the other challenge is um, an awful lot of African-Americans have talked to us about the pain of facing the enslaver who is part of one's family, who raped a great, great grandmother or further back. So that's a hard, part of the journey. For descendants of enslavers, it's a little more clear cut that their ancestors own slaves because there are slave schedules and tax forms and um, that kind of information. And for a lot of descendants of enslavers who really jump in and persist with their research, what we hear is they want to take the X's and the um, lists with no names and turn them into people. They want to rehumanize the folks that their ancestors dehumanized. And so they get into the research and they learn more. And some people find, they find individual, they find descendants, they find people who are alive now descended from either an enslaver ancestor or um, a formerly enslaved person. And they begin to figure out how to make contact. And they may succeed at that and connect. And some of the people who connect create relationships and have conversations. And they may go on to work on projects together and take reparative action. And I know that there will be breakout groups tomorrow that will address a number of those points. And I encourage you, if you're interested, to, to go to those breakout groups. So at this point, I'm going to turn the microphone, as it were, over to other members of the group to tell their stories about um, what it was <laughs> like. And I just saw a note to myself. Before I leave this map, we are called the Link Descendants Working Group. We are very supportive of people looking for their Link Descendants, but you don't have to have a Link Descendant. You don't even have to be looking for a Link Descendant to be part of the group. What the bottom line really for us is, do you see your link to slavery in the past? And do you see your link to its legacies today? and research will help you get there if you haven't landed there already. And everything else is wonderful, wonderful uh, additional um, outcomes. 
So uh, Libby, I'm gonna turn the map and the storytelling over to you. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Libby Flock and I'm just gonna share a little slice of my journey that has to do with this first part of the map here. And each stage and in between periods take time and they're really best not rushed and they're not linear. And I want to acknowledge that my specific perspective is that of a white woman with enslaver ancestors. So it's not going to be the same for everyone, but some of these truths are universal. And about a year and a half ago, it suddenly hit me that I should look into my mom's deep Virginia roots. I'm a California girl. Um, and I found the slave schedules right away. And within a few hours, I realized that there were 130 people that just three of my ancestors had enslaved. So it was a really big, uh, rude awakening. Um, I was grateful to find come to the table and the linked descendants I joined right away. And that was me in this initial discover, be told, become aware phase. And we can come back to this no matter how long we've been doing the journey, but this was my very first um, uh, discovery stage. And I jumped right in. I treated it like I did my graduate thesis. <laughs> I powered through, I ignored what I was feeling. I wasn't taking care of myself. I thought at the time that I could get all the answers if I kept searching for clues. I just thought it was a matter of ripping off the Band-Aid, um, pushing hard for a few months, no matter what it took, finding the truth, facing it all and being done. <laughs> um, that's not how it works, but <laughs> I didn't know that at the time. Um, I also wasn't allowing the anger and the grief and the shame to be processed. I didn't think I deserved to feel that because, you know, obviously my feelings were nothing compared to those that had been enslaved and hurt by my ancestors. So it's important that we don't wallow and let our big feelings paralyze us or dither for long periods of time and not take action. But it's also important that we don't shove everything down. It's this in-between stage between discovering and reacting and deciding next step, all where the blue arrows are. That's all processing. And um, you know, if we take action immediately, if we jump from discovering all the way over to connecting with a linked descendant, we can definitely cause um, harm. I identified, Sharon and I identified a linked descendant within the first few months. And um, I really needed to slow down, process, digest, integrate this information. If we don't do that, we end up dumping it all on, um, on others. So thankfully, I worked with Sharon Morgan. She was a fantastic resource and teacher and supportive. Um, also joined an affinity group, worked with nonviolent communication. And I know now this is a circular, messy, it's ongoing work, and it's not linear. And what changes is we become better aware of what's going on with us and also our motivations. Um, let's turn off my timer there. Um, and it's a lifestyle change, right? It's a new identity, a new way to see the world through, a new lens. And we can't just suck it up and face the truth. There aren't just a few truths to learn. We need to take it in bite-sized pieces, but um, even though it's gut-wrenchingly painful, we can't let we can't plow ahead with white supremacist culture characteristics really driving us because then we're just going to cause harm. So it's important we're taking action, but we can share what we learn, not hoard the information, but we can do this in a way that is giving freely and not per putting the burden of relationship on our linked descendants. Um, we can get there eventually and form close relationships, but we really need all these in-between places and be willing to go back, taking time to digest and integrate and acclimate to all this information. So um, it's a lifelong journey that we're on. And I'm just gonna give a quick plug before I pass things over to Allison for our um, workshop tomorrow is on shame and anger, if you'd like to come to that. So Allison, I'll pass it on to you. Hi everybody, Allison Thomas in LA, another California girl. Uh, Libby's covered part of this, but again, it's about the allowing yourself time to go through these steps so that they sink in. And I use the model of a spiral because I feel like I have to, I think I figure stuff out and then I look at a document again or think about a relationship and I, I, have, I, re, I revisit 
and then I spiral up and I revisit and spiral up. And it's a constant process. It is the opposite of linear. Um, and part of this is it takes time, especially as someone who descends from enslavers, to shift your identity, your point of view out of the white centered world that we have grown up in and is so embedded in our DNA. And so that's where you have to, your identity shifts and then you can read stories of the same events and they have a different impact. And I would also urge that this is not only about ancestral research or um, you know, history. You have to learn the history as well as your family and you just understand the context for things. But it is also about doing your own work on your unearned racial advantages, white privilege, and those aspects of it, because you need to be able to decenter de your whiteness. So in that sense, it really connects so closely with coming to the table and the overall focus of this organization to get out of, to heal the harms of slavery, which requires this kind of identity shift. And so those of us who find ourselves doing this through linked descendants do it in this context. Um, so I really don't have much more to say, but I think that we're going to talk a little bit later about um, doing the writing and the rest of the processing, but obviously part of this is correcting not just your own identity, but family narratives. So communicating this work back out um, and developing those school skills for continuing to communicate about just not just the journey, but the results, because we all learn pretty tough stuff. So I'm going to now turn it over to Sharon. You're muted. You're muted, Sean. The first thing I want to say is how do we define linked descendants? So on one hand, we are trying to, for African-American people, we are trying to connect with people who are biologically related to us, who are other Black people. And on the other hand, we're trying to connect with the people who enslaved us. So there are two versions of that. So for coming to the table, that's kind of a big question because it's wonderful that we have this community that wants to bring us all together at the table of brotherhood, but we have to kind of expand that picture so that you understand what is the table of brotherhood. So I'm just gonna put that bomb out there and leave it. I have worked with several people in this group uh, and the, as the diagram shows, the first step is that you discover or you are told or you become aware that you are connected in, within this, the paradigm of slavery. And it is uh, interesting because black people know that and white people often don't. There are many people that I work with that they're like, oh, wow, well, my ancestors came from North Carolina and maybe they own slaves slaves so the pair the picture is if your ancestors lived in the the deep southern states the deep 10 southern states and had land that was more than they could farm they probably owned slaves if your ancestors are black and they lived in those same states they were probably enslaved because there were very few people, less than 10%, who were free. So what do you do when you find out this information? You either recoil from it or, and ignore it, or you decide that you're gonna do something with it. And I'm very happy to be with a group of people who have decided they're gonna do the next steps. So what are the next steps? You have to uh, uncover that history. 
you have to reveal family documents and things that you find that will help us connect people together. You have to contact and connect. It's like when you see, when you find a slave schedule, what do you do? You can trace those people and see if they have living descendants, which is part of the work that I do with our Black ancestry. And then if you find a living descendant, you need to have an ongoing dialogue. Some people will not want to talk to you. Others will be very happy to know that you are acknowledging this and you are willing to be in, engaged. And you have to accept whatever the result is. Whatever the result is, you need to do something to forward this. You have to speak, you have to write, you have to process, you have to do something that will expose this information because one of the big deals is saying the names. When you find documents of people who are enslaved, you need to say their names. You need to write them down in a place where people can find them now who are researching and there is a, pro, a project that is being done by Family Search uh, called Reclaiming Our African Roots, where you can actually document, you can put on a template the names of the enslaved people you have found in wills and deeds and other places, and be able to send them to me so that eventually we will put them online. And hopefully Family Search will get faster about this because I'm really unhappy with their progress. And also you have to, when you find a descendant of a person enslaved by your family, engage them. I mean, you have to talk, you have to write, you have to process it, go to the reunions. I mean, do things that make community, that make an engagement with them and try to find ways to do reparative action. So here is one example of a reparative action. Allison has done, has set up a website for Gwen's Island descendants. And she is making a place for all of these people who were disabled, who were dispossessed of this island will be able to find information about their ancestors. So you can do that. You can write a book. You can, you know, do things. Uh, just putting the information online is a really big thing. So it was just said that Sharon is the one who makes the research happen. I try my best to do that. But <laughs> And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But you have to do the research and you have to look into this and you have to, it's not easy, but it is something that you need to do. The biggest problem that I run into is white people resist. They are so much in denial that they don't want to see this. And one beautiful thing about coming to the table is that this is a place where white people are not in denial. That they really, it's like, we really want to see it, uncover it, confront the truth and do something. And that means so much to me for the years that I've been involved with this group. And I wish that that could be exported to others who don't feel the same way. So that's just my little soapbox thing. I wanna give kudos to Libby and Allison and others that have engaged me to do their research. And largely we have found living descendants and largely we have found people who are willing to communicate. And largely we have been able to do some kind of a reparative action because of those relationships. And it doesn't happen 100% of the time, 
but it has been an incredibly uh, inspirational thing for me to see that this is something. That's all I have to say. I'm turning it over to Angela. Thank you, Sharon. And Angela, I think you're going to pick up on a couple I of am. points that yes. Sharon was just making. So good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the big red explosions are, are my head exploding around this issue. Um, about six years ago, I discovered my family's relationship with slavery. My cousin was reading a will to my mother and me, the will of my mother's third great grandfather. The will contained a list of people enslaved by this ancestor, which was shocking enough. But even more disgusting to me was the line in which my ancestor directed that, quote, my Negro boy Spencer, unquote, should be raised in the household of the ancestor's daughter as a playmate for her son. Meanwhile, Spencer's mother, Nancy, was to be sold off along with all of the rest of the enslaved. Well, my head exploded like you see there on the screen. I screamed at my mother and my cousin. My mom quietly said, there's nothing we can do about it. So there's no reason to be upset. It was a long time ago. And I yelled back at my nearly 90 year old mom. Well, there may be nothing you can do about it, but there's something I'm going to do about it. And I went off to find coming to the table and the link descendants. Since that time, I've learned that I have many, many enslaver ancestors on both sides of my family. Nearly all were small farmers. They were part of the many tens of thousands of, quote, pioneers who moved from Virginia down the Shenandoah Valley to parts south and west. They not only opened up the country using enslaved labor, they were also part of the big rush of European settlers who took advantage of the displacement of the Cherokee and Creek nations. My ancestors helped European America realize its manifest destiny at the expense of African and indigenous Americans. One ancestor listed his profession in the county records as, quote, overseer of slaves. Another family line tried but failed to lynch a black man in Georgia in 1902. I had grown up in a family where slavery was never discussed. Also, my parents didn't have an answer to my childhood question, why do we get to live here if the Cherokees had to leave? My parents were well-educated, college professors. They were considered very liberal for white Southerners during the civil rights era. They were in favor of integration of the college where I grew up. But the truth about small town life for a white child in the deep south in the 50s and 60s, talking about slavery was taboo, just as it had been during slavery times, and it still is today. It was, and it's still very difficult to talk about, and especially so with one, within one's own family. Growing up, how many times did I hear the admonition, polite people don't discuss politics, race, or religion? So it's inconceivable that just five years ago, I would be standing here before you to talk to you frankly about this subject. It was easier for me to come out as a gay person 45 years ago than it has been for me to come out as a descendant of enslavers. And yet the signs were there and I should have been able to see those racial waters I was swimming in. I want to show you this picture. I don't know if you can see it. My, 
of me and my sister with our two moms, one black mom and one white mom. Everybody in the college town I grew up, where I grew up had a black housekeeper. Our housekeeper's name was Barbara. My mom hired Barbara to take care of me and my baby sister when I was two years old. My mom went back to work. Barbara took care of our family and her own family for more than 50 years, six days a week, taking care of our family while she had her own family. Monday through Saturday, in keeping with the way things were, Barbara always called my mom, Mrs. Dickey. My mom called Barbara just Barbara. How I wish that Barbara were still here so I could ask her the many questions I have in my heart about her story, what she gave up for our family, what her ancestors must have given up for white families, for white comfort. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. And the <clears throat> next person that's going to tell her story is Jerry Stewart. And Jerry is my cousin. We are linked descendants biologically as well as in our hearts. Jerry, please tell your story. Well, I can remember listening intently as a very young little girl about my, to stories about my maternal ancestors as was told to me by my grandmother and my great aunts. It was in hushed tones that they told my sister and I of a very special five times great grandmother that we had. Her name was Sarah Sally Hemings. She had a secret relationship with a very prominent gentleman named TJ. And they had four children who survived to adulthood after a rough childhood, but became thriving adults one of which was my four times great grandfather, Madison. I didn't realize until I was in the third grade that the TJ that they were talking about was the third president of the United States. In school that day, they told us that we had to memorize the names of the first five presidents. And I go running, running home to ask my mother, is the prominent gentleman TJ that you all keep telling us about the third president? So she told me, yes, but we are never to discuss it out. Don't you dare tell anyone at school. And so over the next 45 years, I kept that secret. It wasn't until there was DNA that all of a sudden it was a story we were allowed to share. Now, um, the story didn't dwell on the fact that Sally had been enslaved. It was more about the kind of skills that they had learned to be prosperous and survive and pass down generation to generation. So that I ended up with a story that was a very proud one to tell. Um, there was also this gorgeous picture that I found out was shown in every home across the southern part, every Black home across the southern part of Ohio, and it was of the Young family. The lady in the middle of the picture was my three times great-grandmother, and it was she and her husband and their 10 kids. And so I learned to realize as going from one relative's house to the other, that we all shared this one big photo and we could pick which one of those 10 children we were descended from. It wasn't, um, wasn't until uh, we started doing the stories of uh, Sally Hemings that 
the picture became even more prominent and actually displayed on a, in a presentation in the Smithsonian. Um, once I was able to share more and talk about the story, we started going things like the reunions that were held at Monticello and other family reunions where family stories were told. That was where I had the opportunity to meet some of my very special cousins like Prenny and a few others. And we started working on things like um, what it would mean to provide reparations and that sort of thing. And so coming up with projects that could help make the family come closer together, all parts of the family. And one of the times that I was at one of these reunions, there were some ladies there that told me that I should consider joining Coming to the Table. And that's how I got started about seven years ago with Coming to the Table. Um, I also have had a recent opportunity to join the uh, Link Descendants group at the end of last year. And they are now um, encouraging me to be a part of the writing group. Um, I have been keeping a little bit of a blog about the stories of my family and, and I'm being encouraged very well by them to help save these stories for my little nephew. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. And it's the perfect lead in to where we're gonna go next. Libby, if you can, I'm just gonna put a picture up momentarily. If you can take us into bittersweet and do you want me to stop sharing because you've got the, there you go. Are you muted? I realized I was still Maybe. muted. I was talking to you, but here I am. Okay. <laughs> um, so the you can see the screen, yeah, the bittersweet blog. Yes. So this was launched in 2013 by a group of coming to the table members. And we've just revamped the site and just launched it this week. So I'm going to give you all a little tour here. So we're going to start out with the original bittersweet storytellers. And that includes Prinny, Sharon Morgan, Felicia Furman, Pam Smith. And they came from a wide variety of backgrounds. They originally got together to tell about their families that are linked to and through slavery with stories of research, discovery, initial contacts, connections, and relationships. So um, Prinny and, and Dan, Sharon, so these are the original bittersweet storytellers and Prinny and Felicia have really been the sustainers these past few years. And now we have a next generation of storytellers and Allison and I have, um, we're now serving as co-managers of the site. And we work closely with many of the authors and we can always use help. So if anybody wants to help, please reach out. But um, we have stories from people like Trina and Tony, and Allison's going to talk in a minute about our writing pods. So anyone is welcome to submit a piece for consideration. You can go to this write, for, write with us area and read about that. You can also um, later after Allison explains about the writing pod, you go here and to write for us and click here and fill out an interest form. But we also have frequently asked questions. If you have a piece or you're working on one, you can go ahead here and read about topics and all kinds of answers to your questions. And you can reach out to us here through contact us. You can either fill out the form or you can email us here. And um, please don't hesitate. We would love to work with you, even if you just have um, some ideas and don't know where it's going to go. Um, we're going to have a follow button on here soon where you can be notified of new posts. But for now, I'm just going to give you a little more of a tour of the site. So this is where the posts are, and they're in chronological order with the most recent first. And you can choose to click on any of them, and you can keep going in chronological order. Or you could go down here to the categories. So say you wanted to read about linked descendants. 
you would click here and it will take you to a page that just has the category. And a lot of these categories overlap, but we've categorized them so they're easier to navigate through. And say that you wanted to read about descendants, you go here. And, oh, that's where I just was, <laughs> sorry. I'm trying to find something. So here's the bittersweet editor. So say that you wanted to read something by only everything by the bittersweet editors or only something by Tony. You would go here and it would show you that. So then you click on a post. And again, you can get to the categories from here, get to the authors from here. And then usually at the bottom, there's a bio that tells you about the um, author and it will also have their website if they have one. Um, and then just lastly, you can read more about Bittersweet, the blog and how it was formed and all of that. And then we have a great resources section you can go to with lots of information and links. Um, so feel free to poke around, reach out to us and I'm gonna go ahead and pass you on to Allison now to tell you about our writing pods and um can you put that yeah. back up Libby that has you want me to put it back up because we had a slide for you as well but okay I'll put oh, there's a slide for, there's a slide yeah Prinny would you put the slide up I will and okay before Allison says anything I want to say Libby you are amazing and didn't know what I was doing, but thank you. I believe I'd known how much work this was going to be. I don't know that she would have followed through. Unbelievable. So yeah. We, we are we're hugely grateful, and it's taken thank hours you. and hours. And then to make the deadline of trying to be able to show it to you today has been an extra bit of <sighs> pressure. So you hear that sigh? That was Libby sighing. <laughs> so Bittersweet is for folks who are regular writers and perhaps are um, uh, have written in the past or you've been writing for a while. But we also feel so strongly that writing is an excellent way to process the emotions that arise when we research our enslaved and enslaver ancestors. And it, you can write just for yourself or for your family. Uh, our bittersweet community or a broader audience. And also some people are doing art projects or um, weaving, fabric art, different kinds of performance art. There's different things to do. And so we thought that we would adapt the model for the local group and offer an opportunity to do writing pods. So the idea would be that uh, if you click through on the page that Livy had showed you just a minute ago, you can fill out a form with your writing interests. And as we get six people at a time, we'll spin you off. And we've got writing guidelines and we can provide some early facilitation help. Um, and if you ever wanna submit something to Bittersweet, we would be thrilled, but really the idea is to offer another tool for processing um, and for writing in community. I mean, I think we all recognize how hard this work is, so writing in community. So we have, um, some basic questions so that we know a little bit about kind of where you're at um, so we can group people together. It, it ultimately ends up being a scheduling issue in some way. And then someone from the group will become a facilitator, which means having a Zoom account and kind of keeping people on schedule. And Tanya just has weighed in. Tanya, we, we piloted this with Tanya, Libby, Tony, Francis, uh, Trina, I know I'm forgetting some people, Sharon was part of that early on. And so it worked so well that we thought that we would keep it going. So we just launched three more groups, I don't know, two months ago um, that Leslie, Ethi, and Judith are facilitating. And it seems to be going fairly smoothly. Our thought is that perhaps in the fall or by the end of the year, we'd have some kind of gathering for all of us. Um, we're doing this and have a speaker or something like that. So this is a real casual, don't expect a lot of uh, PowerPoints and hands-on. It's, it's a different kind of thing. And you know, writing groups are a place to meet regularly and talk about your work in a community that gets to know your work so that they can provide valuable feedback. And sometimes that feedback is uh, research oriented and sometimes it's writing and editing. So we have guidelines for critiques and some group, it took us a long time to even share our writing in our initial group. So 
it's really we want each group of six to set their own guidelines in the same way a local group does. So I think that's everything I wanted to say. So, um, but again, we've got resources and ideas, meeting topics. We try to throw a bunch of stuff into some Google Docs. So feel free to fill that out and launch with that. And I am now going to turn it over to Sharon to talk about our Black ancestry. Well, I think we've covered our Black ancestry to the extent that we can. In this talk, we'll have to schedule a separate time for our Black ancestry to, to talk because we're, we've reached the end of the session. So I wanted that to- That is so sad because I had more to say. Come on, I'm so Let's sorry, go. darling. <laughs> Let's ask Tom. How are we doing on time, Tom? Um, uh, uh, you know, Sharon, go quickly. As I don't as, need you know. a lot. I just, I'll be, I'll be, I try to be really quick. All right, go for it. Okay, this is important to me. Yes. I am a writer and genealogist. Okay, so I do both things at the same time. It, had, it is very important. I've looked at the chat box. So uh, tomorrow I will be doing. Doing it and find link to sentence and how to do the research. That is from 1230 to 2 Central Time. It's a breakout session. And I want to stop by saying it is not just about collecting the names, it is about making the stories. You have to say their names, you have to restore their humanity. And I would really like to see the stories. So tomorrow I will be able to say much more and Tom will not shut me off. And Prinny won't either. Okay, well, I love all of y'all. So, hey, here we are. And we all love you, Sharon. And I would never cut you off. Did you notice that? Uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> you did not mute my button. Okay, good. No, <laughs> good boy. Thank okay. You. Okay. So just to wrap up, we've learned a lot. A lot of which is relevant to everybody in coming to the table. And I'm gonna pick just a couple of points. One is the in huge importance of doing our own work, of growing our self-knowledge, becoming more emotionally intelligent, developing our communication skills so that uh, our contacts and our dialogues can be as productive as possible. And for each of us to find their own personal platform for speaking, writing, teaching, acting, creating art that addresses the legacies of slavery and a more honest and just United States. If you're interested in joining the Link Descendants group, you can sign up at the on the website. Um, just look for the working groups and then find the Link Descendants working group. There will also be information in the handout that will come out at the same time as the link to the video of this session. And all the information we've covered today and more will be in that handout. And I wanna say thank you so much to, I wanna say thank you to our ancestors who are the reason we're here and whose wisdom has come down to us. I wanna say thanks to you, Tom and Jody, and to coming to the table for hosting us for this session. Um, thank you to Jerry and Sharon for being guests with the work, Link Descendants presentation to Libby and Allison and Angela for everything they've been doing. I am so blessed to have this group of people working with me. And um, I wanna say thank you to all of the people on Zoom right now for joining, joining our journey for an hour today. And I hope you'll link your journey to ours in the future. Have a good afternoon. Wow.